Um, okay, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, the topic of the webinar is Unlocking the Potentials of Abacus for Nonlinear FEA Part 2. Last month, I held the first part of the webinar, and today we have the second part. And uh, I am Amir Hossein Mirza Bozorg, and I have Master of Science in the Mechanical Engineering. The first part of this webinar explained that a nonlinear FE model can be investigated from two perspectives, physical and numerical. And the numerical point of view has five aspects, including mesh, interaction, step, solver, and material definition. This webinar concentrates on the most important aspect, the mesh and explains the effect of different mesh settings on the results and resolving numerical issues. It will also explain a few points related to the other aspects. And uh, before starting the presentation, let me tell you about the gifts for participants. Partic participants can buy every premium tutorial or package from the Femex YouTube channel with a 50% discount, you can use this offer until the end of October 30th. And there is no limitation on the number of purchase tutorials and packages with a 50% discount. To use the offer, please contact us via Telegram or WhatsApp or email. Telegram and WhatsApp number is here. And also for contacting via email, you can use this email. Um, now I want to review um, some of the points that I mentioned in the first part of this webinar because we need them for the second part. A finite element model can be investigated from two points of view, physical and numerical. About the physical point of view, a finite element model must always be correct from the physical point of view. And the numerical settings must not disturb the physical conditions at all. And about the numerical point of view, you can use different numerical settings for a finite element model and all of them are correct from a physical point of view. But some of them will lead to numerical issues and errors before the end of simulation. Now I want to give you an example. Here, um, suppose that we have a very simple problem. We have a cantilever beam, okay? It is fixed from one end and we have uniform pressure here, okay? It is a very simple pr problem. What are the physics of the problem? One of them is that we have pressure and its distribution is uniform. And for example, its value is 10 megapascal. Okay. And the next one is this boundary condition. Okay. Here it is fixed. Here we do not have roller boundary condition or pin boundary condition. It is fixed. So when you want to define it in abacus, so you must set u1, u2, and ur3 equal to zero. Okay? This is the physics of the problem. Another thing is the material. Suppose that it is made of aluminium. If it is made of aluminium, then its Young's modulus is approximately 70 gigapascal. Okay? It is near 70 gigapascal. If you change the Young's modulus and, for example, use 200 gigapascal, it is not a steel anymore. It is not aluminium anymore. It will be a steel. Okay? It will be a steel. 
and also you must not change this boundary condition but you can change the element size you can change the element type for example um you can mesh it with um one millimeter element or 10 millimeter element size okay what is the difference is the accuracy and the simulation time or you can use first order element second order element you can use quadratic element or you can you can use triangular element these are numerical settings okay when you change the element size when you change the element type when you are changing the element geometric order you are changing the numerical settings okay you can use different numerical settings but you cannot change the physics of the problem okay here what i have written these are the physics of the problem another thing is the uh, loading condition for example if the load is quasi static or it is an impact load okay also this is the physics of the problem and uh, these are very important if you uh, for example if your loading condition is impact load but you change it in a quasi static manner then the simulation result is wrong so your model must always be correct from the physical point of view or physics point of view but the numerical settings can change okay that's it now i want to talk about different numerical settings of a finite element model that do not disturb the physics of the model um about the mesh settings we have element geometric order it can be uh, first order or second order we can have element formulation for example it can be um, reduced integration or full integration or hybrid element or incompatible mode element also we have the element size for example the element size can be one millimeter or two millimeter or one meter for example in some simulations uh, we set the element size to one meter in some regions and also we have the mesh pattern mesh pattern can be mapped or unmapped and uh, we will talk about all of them later on and in this webinar we will focus on the mesh settings the other one is the interaction for example if you have contact interaction um, the contact type can be surface to surface or uh, general contact and contact formulation can be uh, a small sliding or finite sliding and contact properties can differ for example you can have frictionless contact or frictional contact for example here in this model um, here we have a rigid punch and here we have a thick aluminium plate I go to the interaction module here you can see that I have defined surface to surface contact between them and also the master surface is the rigid punch because it is rigid and the slave surface is the aluminium plate because it is deformable and here the sliding formulation is finite sliding why because uh, when it penetrates and when it indents the plate then um, we have meaningful deformation and uh, uh, we have meaningful movements of uh, plate nodes on the surface of the rigid punch so i set it to finite sliding because our uh, our indentation is finite okay so we use finite sliding but for example if it was a kind of um joint for example a bolt joint bolt connection and it was um uh, stiff enough then you can use a small sliding for simplicity if your loading is in the interval of load design for example suppose that your connection can resist up to 10 kilonewtons okay so for loads less than 10 kilonewtons you can use a small sliding 
okay for your uh, bolt interaction I mean contact interaction between bolt and the joint that's it and also contact properties it can be frictional or frictionless for example here um, it is friction frictional and the friction coefficient is 0 0.1 for example um, if uh, it is not lubricated the contact is not lubricated then the friction coefficient is usually 0 0.15 or more for example it, it can be 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.5 even for example a steel to concrete uh, interaction the friction coefficient can can be increased to 0 0.5 but when it is lubricated it can be 0 or 0 0.05 um, yes and the other ones the other numerical aspects they are step settings for example incrementation settings uh, the you you can set uh, different values for initial time increment size maximum time increment size and uh, minimum time increment size for example if you are using the dynamic implicit step or a static general step and the other setting is artificial damping value uh, it helps the convergence in nonlinear analysis and also if you are using the explicit solver you can define mass scale for quasi-static analysis to speed up the simulation for example here um, I have solved the first model with the static general step and I have used automatic stabilization and this is the artificial damping it helps the convergence rate okay uh, for all of the static and quasi-static problems, I always use this setting because it helps the convergence rate. And here you can see the settings for the incrementation. Actually, these are numerical settings, okay? They are not uh, about the physics. For example, here I can change the maximum to 0.05. But, for example, according to my experience, for such moderate nonlinear simulation, these settings are good. Okay, the convergence rate is good and uh, the accuracy is also acceptable. And about the mass scale, for example, here uh, I think I have solved the third model via the dynamic explicit step, and here you can see that I have defined mass scale to speed up this simulation actually you can solve the static and quasi-static um, problems via the dynamic explicit step and to speed up the simulation you can define mass scale and also this value is a numerical setting it is not a physical setting okay for example you can increase it up to 100 okay it affects the accuracy but um uh, physics of the problem um, doesn't differ okay too much and uh, they are not violated or interrupted that's it the other one is the solver settings for example number of attempts and convergence settings um, about the number of attempts for example if I set it to model 1 if I go here These are the convergence criteria, okay, or uh, convergence settings. If you increase them, the simulation uh, will converge easier, but the accuracy may decrease. So we usually don't change these settings. But here, you can change this setting if your simulation is highly nonlinear, because in highly nonlinear simulations, for example, in the crack propagation simulations, or in the damage simulations um, we increase it to 10 or 15 because they are highly nonlinear and maybe more attempts is needed to avoid the convergence errors like too many attempts okay that's it and also material definition for example uh, the plasticity model and the damage model we have different plasticity models okay 
and uh, this is a numerical setting that uh, which plasticity model do you use okay uh, for example for cyclic loading you can use kinematic hardening or combined hardening and for monotonic loading we use isotropic plasticity here if I show you again um, in this model it is isotropic why because um, our loading is monotonic okay it is not cyclic okay if it was cyclic you must use kinematic or combined and also damage model we have different damage models like the johnson cook damage model ductal damage shear damage and all of these uh, can be used in a numerical simulation now i want to talk about ma uh, major abacus numerical errors as you may know um okay um, as you may know, Abacus has two structural solvers, Abacus Standard and Abacus Explicit. The other name of the Abacus Standard is Implicit Solver because it uses implicit algorithm and they are based on iteration and attempt. And the other name of the Abacus Explicit is the Explicit Solver because it uses the Explicit Integration Scheme and it doesn't use iteration it doesn't use attempt so these settings the settings of these steps uh, or these solvers are different okay that's it and uh, for example for abacus standard we have two common numerical errors like too many attempts made for this increment and time increment required is less than the minimum specified both of these errors are due to convergence issues. Your model can be correct from the physical point of view, but maybe you face these errors. So you must change the numerical settings. For example, you must change the mesh size. You must change the element type. You must change the incrementation settings. You must change the contact type, okay? To overcome these errors but your changes and your modifications on the numerical setting must not violate the physics of the problem for example if the loading is uh, dynamic you must not change it to quasi static loading okay because it is the physics of the problem and about the abacus explicit we have errors like elements have distorted excessively the ratio of deformation speed to wave speed exceeds 1 and 0 element type increment estimate. Um, the major errors of these two solvers are different because their mathematical procedure is different. And um, each of them uh, has their own advantages and disadvantages. Okay? Actually, um, as the Abacus Explicit Solver does not have a convergence problem, maybe you think that, okay, I can solve all of the quasi-static problems using this solver instead of this solver. Yes, it is one of the main methods to overcome the convergence issues, but this solver also has its own problems and maybe they arise okay maybe they happen for example this one if you have large deformation maybe this error happens if the element size is not appropriate if the element type is not appropriate okay that's it so um, if you do all the settings of your nonlinear FE model with enough expertise you will not face the numerical error even if you face any numerical errors, there will be no worries as you have enough expertise to resolve them. So the key point is having enough expertise and um, the goal of this webinar is giving you more expertise in this regard. What is the effect of each numerical setting on the nonlinear FE simulation? 
if you have the answer to this question, then you will know do's and don'ts in troubleshooting the abacus errors. That's it. Now I want to talk about the first rule in resolving the numerical issues. The first rule is the modifications must not change the physics of the FE model. I explained it before. For example, we are allowed to change the loading rate if there are no rate dependent material properties and no dampers in the model's boundaries or interactions. For example, when using rate dependent materials like viscoelastic material, the loading rate must not change. Okay? Because if you change the loading rate, then uh, the material will change because it is rate dependent. Or if there is a coupled thermomechanical model and the temperature field is transient, the loading rate must not change, like hot rolling or extrusion. Now I want to talk about using dynamic steps instead of static steps. One of the most effective methods for resolving convergence issues in a static or quasi-static models is using dynamic steps instead of a static general or even a static Ricks steps. The example is dent on the aluminum thick plate with rigid punch. Here we have this example and um, when um, actually we have a tutorial for uh, this example and when I upload this webinar in my YouTube channel, I will put its link here. Um, then you can go and watch its preview. Um, here you can see that, uh, for example, in model one, I have used a static general step. In model two, that is similar to model one, I have changed the step to dynamic explicit and I have used mass scaling. Uh, here uh, I have not used mass scaling. Uh, here I have changed the loading rate, okay? Uh, instead of applying it in one second, I have applied it in 0 0.01 second. And in model 3, I have used dynamic explicit again, and the time period is the same, like a static general, but I have used mass scale to speed up the simulation. And in model 4, I have used the dynamic explicit step and also time period is 1. And as the loading is quasi-static, so I have set the application to quasi-static, okay? Then automatically the load will be applied in a quasi-static manner, so the inertial forces will increase and the simulation will be accurate. And here we have the incrementation settings. Um, in this solution, settings must be made to control the effect of inertial forces and keep them as small in comparison to the other forces. Because when you are using the dynamic steps, um, naturally they account for um, inertial forces. But in, a, in reality, in a quasi-static problem, uh, the inertial forces are very uh, small or approximately zero. So in your simulation, also we must have this condition. So we must do the settings in a way that finally the kinetic energy is much smaller than the internal energy. This is the check for the uh, for uh, this is the check uh, for quasi-static analysis. And but uh, uh, for example, if you are using the dynamic implicit step and you set the application to quasi-static, there is no need to check it anymore, this uh, criteria anymore, because it will be done, okay? But when you are using the explicit solver, to check that the value of mass scale is good or not, okay? For example, it is too much or appropriate, then uh, you must do this check, okay? You must do this check via um, using history output, uh, 
um, here I have defined it. I have defined a set from the whole deformable body that is the plate and I have requested all energies and finally when the simulation is done we must compare ALIE and ALKE okay the uh, kinetic energy must be less than 10% of the internal energy at the end of the analysis um, if the inertial forces are not small enough the model's physics is no longer quasi-static and the solution is inaccurate. When the simulation is completed, the total internal and kinetic energies of all the deformable bodies in the model must be compared and I showed you. Um, and here we have this example again and uh, here um, I have used analytical rigid to model the punch but uh, most of the time I use the discrete rigid okay actually uh, there are two main methods to define rigid bodies in abacus the first one is defining it as analytical rigid and the other is discrete rigid uh, according to my experience discrete rigid is better than analytical rigid because it has less unreasonable errors that's it and uh, it goes down and deforms the aluminium plate and all of the surroundings of the plate are fixed and here you can see the comparison of indentation force displacement curves and the pale brown curve that you cannot see it because the blue curve is on it it is uh, solved via a static general step and then we have the pink one the pink one is uh, solved via dynamic explicit step and I have defined mass scale the coefficient is 36 as you saw and then um, we have dark brown curve okay in the dark brown curve we have used um, dynamic explicit step again and I have used loading rate Loading rate means that you decrease the uh, simulation time. So uh, the load is applied more rapidly. Okay, the load will be applied faster. So here you can see that uh, it has some uh, small differences, but generally all of them are close. And finally, the blue curve is done via the force, uh, via the dynamic implicit step. And actually, most of the time, the result uh, that you have via dynamic implicit step with the quasi-static application is very similar to the result obtained by a static general step and uh, when you use the dynamic explicit step uh, you must have caution about its settings to have a similar result the other example is the four point bending test of reinforced concrete beam and also when I upload this webinar in my YouTube channel here I will put uh, the link to the preview of this tutorial and here uh, we have two moving rigid supports and they will go down for 20 millimeters and uh, the simulation is displacement control and also here we have fixed rigid supports uh, this model includes all of the sources of nonlinearity including the um, contact okay because the supports have contact with the uh, concrete beam also we have uh, plasticity and damage plasticity and damage of concrete and also we have large deformation okay because the concrete will bend so um, this simulation is highly nonlinear. So uh, to overcome the um, convergence issues, I have used the dynamic explicit step to solve it. Also, you can solve it via the static general. Okay, both of them can be used in this case, and even a static general gives you um, acceptable results. And here you can see the reinforcement. 
I have uh, modeled the reinforcement in a, uh, uh, by using wires. It is one di modeling, one dimensional modeling, and uh, I have used truss elements to mesh them. And um, finally, we have this result. Uh, you can see the uh, contour of tensile damage, and you can see the cracks. The cracks are propagated from the bottom of the beam to its top because at the bottom of the beam we have tensile stress. Okay, because in the bending, you can uh, you know that in the bending in the bottom we have uh, tensile stress and in the top we have compressive stress. So um, you can see that the cracks are started from the bottom and they are propagating to the top and they are the same as the cracks that you will see in the experiment. If you um, create and create such a specimen and do the test. And here you can see the um, stress on the reinforcement and due to the propagation of the tensile damage at the bottom of the concrete, the load capacity of the concrete elements in that region is dramatically decreased. Hence, most of the load is transmitted to the steel reinforcement. And here you can see that the axial stress is much more in the bottom rebars in comparison to the top rebars. Why? Because here we have uh, damage, tensile damage in the concrete, so the concrete cannot uh, resist anymore. So only we have reinforcement for loading capacity. And now I want to talk about element formulation settings. Uh, this is the element type window or dialog box in the mesh module. And for example, here, if I go to the mesh, I click on this. We have element type dialog box. Uh, here you can see that we have element library, uh, for example, uh, according to the solver that you are using, you must set it. If your step is dynamic explicit, you must set it to explicit. If your step is a static general or dynamic implicit or, or a static rigs or visco or heat transfer, you must set it to a standard. Also, you must set the family. For example, if your simulation is 2D, planar then uh, you can choose plain stress or plain strain. And here we have geometric order. It can be linear or quadratic. Linear means first order. Quadratic is second order. And the difference is the mid-side node. For example, in the cubic element, suppose that we have this cubic element. In the first order elements, we have a node on each corner, okay? This is the first order element. For example, its name can be C3D8. But in the second order, we will also have mid-side nodes, okay? We will also have mid-side nodes mm. here we have the nodes on the corner and also we have the mid-side nodes That's it. And its name can be C3D20. And also um, here your uh, element can be hybrid formulation or reduced integration or if you deactivate this setting it will be full integration or incompatible mode. So all of these settings will 
lead to the name of the element. Here, by this setting, its name is C3DHR. R means reduced integration, okay, because we have activated it, and it will have one integration point. And if you deactivate it, you will have eight integration points. About the element geometric order, Generally, it's better to avoid using second order or quadratic elements because most of the time they have more convergence issues, more warnings and errors can arise due to the low quality second order elements, and finally their simulation cost is much more without any special gain. Notice that this result is obtained this result i mean these points okay that i mentioned here are obtained from conducting hundreds of simulations in various fields and disciplines it is in contrast with theories of fem and even suggestions mentioned in the abacus documentation even for the tetrahedral elements it's better to use c3 D4 instead of C3D10 or C3D10M. Actually, um, if you have the finite element course in the university, they will tell you that this element, the quadratic element, is more accurate than this element because it has more nodes and also its shape function is more nonlinear. This is correct in the simple problems. But when you have nonlinearity in your model, for example, when you have large deformation, when you have contact, when you have damage, when you have plasticity, then the nonlinear FE solver will have more issues and more problems when using quadratic elements. And using first order elements is much better. Okay, in nonlinear FEA. Even for the tetrahedral elements, okay, in the abacus documentation, it is said that if you cannot use the hex elements, so it's better to use the second order tetrahedral elements with modified formulation. So its name will be C3D10M. Okay, but I'm telling you that according to my experience, this element is better, okay? I know that uh, it is first order. I know that it has constant uh, strain, okay? Because in the, tetra in the linear tetrahedral element, they are constant strain. It means that uh, uh, in the element region, the strain does not change, okay? But in the hex elements, it will change. Uh, and... Also, in the second order tetrahedral elements, it will change. But even with this disadvantage, I think this one is better. If you have large deformation, if you have nonlinearity and other things. About the element formulation, in the simulations that you want to simulate the damage pattern, it's better to use the C3DHR elements than other types of first order cubic elements like C3D8 or C3D8I. Um, this is also according to my experience. Um, these are not written anywhere. And also, uh, hybrid elements like C3D8H are the best choice for hyperelastic and rubber-like materials to capture incompressibility accurately. This is according to Abacus documentation. And also, this is a good point. Hyperelastic materials usually do not undergo damage because they can undergo large strains compared to ductile metals. And here, for example, I have simulated tensile test. I think it's for a steel. I think a steel or aluminium. Or no, no, it's yes, it is a steel. It is a steel. And I have used the Johnson Cook damage for modeling it. And here um, you can see that uh, the damage pattern has a 45 degree inclination. This is correct because it is a ductile material, okay? And we are simulating the ductile fracture. 
and ductal fractures happens in the 45 degree if you have pure tension and um, here I have used this uh, the um, in uh, in 3D I have used the C3 uh, DHR elements and uh, when, uh, also we have this tutorial in our YouTube channel and when I upload this webinar in my YouTube channel I will put the link to this tutorial here and now I want to talk about the element size um, mesh size is one of the most critical factors in the nonlinear FE model each region can have its own mesh size and it can even differ along an edge uh, when you use bias okay we have single bias and uh, another type of bias here we have it if I show you for example the bias can be single or double for example here I have used single bias and the element size is decreasing along the uh, arrow okay in the direction of arrow it is decreasing and the bias ratio is 4 it is the ratio of the smallest sorry it is the ratio of largest to smallest element and also the number of elements in this edge is 11 and uh, the expert FE analyst must determine all of these options about that you use uniform mesh or different element size or what is the element size and inappropriate element size can lead to many issues including convergence issues uh, in the contacting regions or in the large deformation problems inaccurate results in the stress concentration region and inefficient simulation if you use extra fine mesh okay if you use extra fine mesh for example in this model, uh, I have set the minimum element size to 0 0.02, okay? It is 0 0.02. And I, th I think it was good enough. Actually, I didn't do mesh convergence study. And I uh, determined this element size according to my experience. Um, another example for the element size is the scratch test simulation. Uh, here um, I have its file. Here our rigid punch um, indents the specimen and then moves, travels along this path and then goes up. Okay. This is the scratch test simulation. And um, for example, along the traveling path, I have used uniform mesh and I have used 512 elements along the scratch edge and its similar edges. I mean this one and this one and this one. If I show you the mesh, you can see that. Uh, how I have defined the mesh and um, in all of these edges I have used the similar element size okay I have used the similar element size and um, its size is 0 0.023 that's it also um, when I upload this uh, webinar in my YouTube channel, I will put the link to this tutorial here. And uh, here you can see that, for example, uh, here is the first contacting point of the punch. And, you, uh, and I have used uh, seed bias direction and I have used seed bias, okay, because here we have a stress concentrations and these uh, regions are far fields okay these are far fields so we do not have any stress gradients in these regions so um, there is no need to use uh, a small elements okay 
and if I show it here I hide the tip here you can see that here we have bias in this direction bias in this direction and bias in this direction but on this edge along this direction we do not have any bias why because here we have a stress concentration and all of these points are important for us okay but here these are far fields okay so we use large elements here and then we will have an efficient simulation okay we will have both the efficiency and accuracy and um, here in this simulation we have two layers and align the thick one I have used four elements and align the thin one I have used two elements okay to have accurate uh, calculation of stress align the thickness so when you do all of these then you will have such accurate and high resolution stress contour okay and also I have validated this result and um, it is uh, it is like the uh, result in its reference paper and also here you can see that we have uh, an accurate and high resolution result and this is because of using a small elements in the stress concentration region and larger elements in the far fields so you will have both the accuracy and efficiency now I want to talk about the mesh pattern the mesh pattern can affect the accuracy of the simulation and help avoid unreasonable errors especially when using the explicit solver and simulating damage or high speed events we have two types of mesh patterns mapped and unmapped for mapped a stress concentration uh, actually we must use mapped mesh in the stress concentration regions or generally the important regions for us uh, for example here in all of the regions okay in all of the regions I have used mapped mesh okay because um, according to my experience here it was good to use the mapped mesh and also we have unmapped mesh and uh, it is usually appropriate for mesh transition zones what is mesh transition zones for example you have large element in one side and a small element in the other side for example here we have the crack simulation um, here we have a pipe it is the one-fourth of the pipe and here we have elliptical crack okay this is the semi elliptical crack and here we have unmapped mesh tetrahedral unmapped mesh and this is the first transition zone why because here we have a small elements then here we have large elements so i have defined this kind of mesh transition zone and also around the crack we have mapped mesh and also if you see here we have a small elements and here we have large elements okay i have done this technique i have used this technique on both the faces so finally this small element is changed to this large element okay and here we have both the accuracy and efficiency and even along this edge as you can see i have used bias so uh, here we have large element here we have a small elements that's it and um in these regions we have hex elements and in these four contours we have hex elements and only in the first contour we have wedge elements here we have tetrahedral elements and also in other regions we also have hex elements that's it
And finally, uh, you can see the uh, external corrosion on the pipe example. Here we have it. I go to the mesh. Um, here you can see that I have used this kind of partitioning uh, to be able to mesh it with hex elements. And uh, I have tried to create mapped mesh in all of the regions, okay? But you can see that along this edge we have bias, along this edge we also have bias, okay? So we have large elements here and small elements here. We use a small elements here because we have a stress concentration. And here um, you can see that uh, the stress concentration and stress gradients are captured accurately okay that's it and here um, it was uh, it was one fourth okay it was one fourth and in the visualization module I have used the uh, mirror pattern tool then uh, here we have the full model I mean I have created full model result from the one-fourth model result and here you can see the accurate stress contours and another thing um, another thing that I want to say is about the symmetric modeling instead of full geometry modeling symmetry planes are another useful method for resolving some of the issues in nonlinear FE models. A model can have one, two, or three symmetry planes, so we can model half, one fourth, or one eighth of the geometry, respectively. If the model has an axis of symmetry, we can model in the axisymmetric space. Okay? And as only a portion of the geometry is modeled, the number of elements will decrease, resulting in a more efficient simulation. For example, in this model, okay, um, if I check the number of elements, um, we have 21,924 linear elements, okay? If you want to use the similar mesh size and mesh pattern, if you define the um, complete geometry, so you will have near Nine, uh, 90,000 elements, okay? So if you compare them, uh, 21,000 is much better than near 90,000, okay? And also, uh, we will have the accurate simulation, okay? But in, uh, with less cost. That's it. And uh, here, to account for the symmetry, um, if I show you, you must define symmetry boundary conditions, okay? For example, here we have x sim. On these faces, we have x sim. Why? Because the x axis is perpendicular to them. And here we have z sim on this surface or on this face. We have z symmetry because z axis is perpendicular to it okay this is the rule and in some cases like simulating the compression test in the honeycomb lattice or azetic structures we need to reach the symmetric deformation models uh, if uh, 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 if or here it is modes not models um, if possible symmetric modeling is the only way to do this okay so when you want to capture the symmetric modes the symmetric modes of failure or symmetric modes of deformation or symmetric modes of compression you must use the symmetry planes okay this is the only choice because generally the symmetric model is the most effective way to avoid non-symmetric deformation caused by round of errors due to the numerical issues if you use the full geometry, most of the time you will not capture the symmetric deformation, okay? 
This is because of uh, numerical issues and to overcome this you must uh, use symmetry planes and symmetric modeling. Um, I mentioned this before and uh, here I want to introduce you some of our packages and tutorials in our YouTube channel. Uh, here uh, I want to talk about comprehensive abacus package and uh, when I upload this webinar in my YouTube channel, I will uh, put the link to it here, to its preview. And uh, this package is from beginning to advanced and it includes 40 hours of recorded videos. And also uh, you can purchase a smaller sub packages of it instead of the full package, like the mechanical sub package with 36 hours civil or structure sub package with 36 hour or FFS complementary sub package that uh, its duration is 26 hours. It's good for people uh, who are working in the oil and gas industry or in the fixed equipment field uh, and also they want to do fitness for service. And also uh, you can uh, buy this package or any other packages and premium tutorials with 50% discount up to the uh, 30th of October uh, as the gift for participants. Also, packages, specifications, and payment details are provided in the video description in the YouTube channel, and you can pay the cost of the mentioned packages in two, three, or four installments, and one installment per month, and this is for make it easier for you to buy it. And... Um, here uh, we have, uh, I have the explanation of these sub packages, and um, also for each of these sub packages, if we publish an update in the future, all of the updates will be free for you for all of the buyers. All of the buyers who have uh, bought the uh, package before the update. That's it. And also, if you buy the comprehensive abacus package or one of its sub packages, you will have these gifts a permanent 30% discount to purchase every premium package or tutorial on the Femex YouTube channel or Femex.ir website. Our Femex.ir website is for Persian uh, users, um, not international. And 30% discount on online tutoring and consultancy services. This discount is valid up to 4 months and also 30% permanent discount to uh, participate in the premium webinars. If I uh, hold uh, any premium webinars in the future. And also this is the gift for participants again. Yes, and uh, you can contact us for FEA consultancy. And uh, these are our FEA consultancy services uh, sorry services okay so here my presentation uh, is finished and if you have any questions you can ask thank you for your presentation and uh, a small question uh, yes regarding the steps uh, step increment so how to determine that uh, step increment okay okay what is your question so I want to uh, know like how to determine the step increment value like uh, you you added like around uh, uh -huh. 10 to the power 5 or some example. Uh -huh. so Actually, so okay, I will explain. For example, if you are using the static general step, okay, mm -hmm. it depends on the nonlinearity of your simulation. For example, if your simulation um, includes nonlinearity, but they are moderate, like this example. Okay, it has a moderate nonlinearity because in this model we do not have damage or very large deformations. Okay, not very large deformations, not damage. Okay, not fracture. When you don't have these, these settings are good if your time period is one. Okay, uh, for example, if your loading is monotonic. Uh, for cyclic uh, loading, it differs. I mean cyclic, not uh, high cycle or low cycle fatigue. I mean ratcheting problems that, for example, we have in the civil engineering and they want to 
plot the hysteresis curve. Uh, but, but if your simulation is highly nonlinear, for example, it includes damage. Okay, for example, it includes damage. Uh, for example, you are doing an uh, XFEM analysis. Okay, XFEM analysis for crack propagation or others. Then the initial must be around 0.001 and maximum must be 0.01 and also minimum must be this again and also in the settings of the solver for example here um, you must activate it then they are increased it is better and also you must increase IA for example you must increase it to 15 okay uh, because um, in the highly nonlinear simulation you will uh, you will have more cutbacks okay and to uh, avoid too many attempts error you must increase it but this is not enough okay actually people think that to overcome too many attempts error if they increase this it is okay it is resolved no all the other settings of your model must be correct for example your mesh must be fine enough your um, interaction settings must be good enough okay I mean all of the things must be appropriate and then if you need uh, if you need more cutbacks then you increase IA okay so um, it depends but I answered your question about uh, their values for moderate nonlinear simulation this is good enough but if you have highly nonlinear simulations, for example, uh, if you want to, um, for example, I don't know, a kind of um, fracture analysis or you want to model um, uh, damage, for example, you want to simulate tensile test. You want to simulate tensile test via the static general step, it's better to use 0.001 here and the maximum will be set to 0.01 okay we decrease them we decrease them because our simulation is more nonlinear that's it do you have any other questions did you um, get yeah. your answer so like um, yeah about this presentation you know i'm clear with this and like how much does it cost for the package like for mechanical package um uh, you can uh, please ask me about this after the class please um send a message to me okay in telegram or whatsapp or send email to me then um i will answer you okay yeah. we will okay. talk and as you have the 50 percent discount but even if you uh, at present go to our youtube channel and mm -hmm. you find this uh the, the this tutorial its uh, cover is is like this then uh, okay. in the description below the video, the prices of all of the sub packages are mentioned and also the table of content and all of the things. And all, all the, until the 30th of October, you can buy it with 50% discount and also you can pay it in uh, two or three or four installments. Uh, where are you from? Mm -hmm. I'm from India. Uh -huh, very good. If you are from India, you can also, because... Um, most of the Indians, they do not have PayPal account. If you have PayPal account, you can pay via PayPal. If you don't have PayPal, there is no problem. You can pay in rupees via GPay because uh, I have someone, one of my students in India that can receive rupees and then he sends it to me via his PayPal account. Yes, I ask because, uh, because I want to know that uh, about the payment method that you can use. Okay, so... Uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. What, what is your next question? Uh -huh. Don't have or have? I don't have. Like, uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah. So thank you so much for your participation. And now I end um, this uh, webinar. And then you can contact me for buying the, uh, the, the full package or one of its sub packages. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good time. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you.